station. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, this is what we were talking about earlier. Uh, you need to get, if you're an inspector, get you a, a good uh, handheld GPS. That way you can check on the tower locations to make sure that it matches what is actually in the, um, uh, actually on the license. Uh, I'll tell a funny story on Wendell sitting back here, but I went to do one of their facilities. I guess it was, may have been Demopolis or somewhere. I forgot where it was. And I was, I had a GPS in the car. And when I was driving down the road, it said the tower was on the right-hand side of the road, but the tower was actually on the left-hand side of the road. I said, now what is that all about? So when I get there, were you there? So this, yeah, you were out there. And I went out and set this out and read it. And sure enough, it was supposed to be on the other side of the road. But we found out it was some paperwork errors. And, and they finally two numbers around. Oh, had, had two yeah. numbers had gotten yeah. poked around. So I was going to write up my report and tell Wendell, you just got to, to hook, get your truck and hook it up to the tower and slide it across <laughs> yeah. the street. You know, and, and, and you'll... And, and you'll be legal. Yeah. You know? and, and those aren't uncommon. I'm, uh, I've got a client uh, in another state that I work with, and in the process of them leasing to another station on their tower, they found out that they were several seconds off. And there was a slight period of panic because, you know, once you get to a certain point, you're now refiling for an entire license, and luckily they didn't have to do that. But that, that is something you still should watch is, is you go in and, and use your GPS, not your car GPS, but use a handheld that these do have very good accuracy and uh, you can lay them down near the base of the tower and get a good reading from them. Except an AM. That's right. Yeah, but don't put it on his 50 kilowatt. We could try it out at Frank's tomorrow. Did you bring your meter? I did. But oh, okay. Let, no, I don't. Know. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the uh, you don't see that as often as you used to because it was a few years ago. The commission came out with this ruling that everybody had to verify their. Well, it's been not three or four years. Ago, oh, it's been yeah. longer than that, where you had to verify and resurvey the location. Your towers. And most people actually hired a surveyor to go out and make sure. And there were some people that were <laughs> way off, way off. So their towers are in the wrong location, but. That's a good investment, and these are not that expensive. No. As a matter of fact, this particular one, this particular model here, I was telling John about it, has a feature where if you're working on AMs, where you have to go out on certain radials, maybe the 135 degree radial or 270 or whatever, and you typically uh, can divide it into 360 degrees. Well, degrees are rather wide, and if you're looking for a null and trying to read a directional and make sure the null is right where it's supposed to be and you're supposed to be on the 135 degree radio, you can walk several steps either way and still be in, on that radio based on the 360 degree divisions. But this unit actually has a way that you can, there's a little formula you use and it will actually divide that 316 degree lines to 6,400 lines. Oh, so you can really, you make one step and you're off yeah. of it, you know. So it makes it very accurate. So uh, I, I didn't know about that when I bought it. <laughs> I just bought it. And then I found out that uh, one of the consultants over in your area, Stu yeah. Graham, said, hey, you know, you can do this. Because we had to go out in the ocean, out in the bay at Florida, when we were doing, uh, I mean in Mobile, when we were doing some radials for an AM station down there. It was actually out in the in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, so there we had to we use that. It, it sat us right on it and everything. That's where Larry found out alligators floated. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is a typical ASR sign. You can make your own uh, just out of any numbers or anything you want to do. This is a uh, professional one that you can actually pay pay money for. <laughs> and, yeah. And, uh, the the one we were talking about in South Carolina, I think he actually. The gates, as I remember, was actually made out of angle iron. Yeah. And he had actually painted the numbers because he asked me, he said, is, is that okay? I said, yeah, as long as people can see the number. He had actually taken some of those little numbers and spray painted it on there. And I said, at least nobody will steal your sign. They may steal the gate, but they won't steal the that, sign. That was the problem they were having. But, and, and this is easy to duplicate. I, uh, 
had a station where we have a tower on one of the dorms at the university, and it's only 30 feet, but we had to have it registered. <laughs> and uh, I just took it down to our folks at the print shop, and they just duplicated it and printed it and made a nice sign, and we stuck on the on the door there. So. Did you use the same number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? I did. I did. I like that number. So. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the, there is a, uh, and this is good for inspectors. There is an app, and I've got it uh, on my iPad. I'll, I can show you during the break. It's called uh, Tower ID, and it, I think it's one of those you pay about four bucks for it. But what it does is you can you can bring it up, and it will show you. It has little push pins, every registered tower within a certain circle. I, I keep the circle sort of. Small because of so many stupid cell towers, <laughs> you'll end up with way too many. But then, when the pin comes up, and I'll show you later how it works, you can click on that pin, and it will show you this number. Then, if you click on that number, it opens up the ASR, and it shows you whose tower it is and when it was built and how tall it is. This has been invaluable to me as an inspector because I can go out in Mobile. There's like about out at Spanish Fort. There's like about five towers out there. And, and sometimes you don't know which one is which, but I can bring that up and I can tell just exactly whose tower is which one. So uh, it's called Tower ID, and uh, I'll, I'll show it to you when we take a break. Uh, AM Power Measurements. Uh, well, I'm giving to y'all. That's, that's my favorite guy there is the, the engineer from the spaceship. And AM, this is a typical AM uh, ATU. It's most of you that work in... In AM, no. This is this is what matches the output of the transmitter to the uh, to the tower, and this is what uh, Frank's got to do to his to try to figure out what's going on out there with it. But there will actually be a meter. This one doesn't have a meter in it, but here's a typical uh, amp meter where you can actually read the current. Now in AM, you read the power by the direct method, and the direct method says is you have to read the antenna current going to the tower, right at the tower. So this meter typically is mounted inside that antenna unit or either is on a plug-in so you can plug it in. You don't want to leave it in there all the time because uh, lightning seems to play havoc with these things if it, if it goes into it. And the way that you actually do it, and, and, this, and this is a little side note, uh, learn how to read meters. Uh, meters come in a thousand different models. And sometimes it's hard to read and determine what the graduations are. And when you try to read a meter, you need to stop and make sure you're, you're reading it correct. See, uh, obviously, this one's pretty easy to read because of the way the divisions are. But you read that. The formula is actually, well, here's another meter here. We actually have one of these over here. The way this actually works, and this is your toy. You can show them how it oh, works. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, this is the toroid, so the, the final output or the feed point of the ATU before it goes to the tower is going to be copper tube, if most of you have looked into an AM box. So it's going to go right through here, not touching the sides. So your line's going to go through here, and it's going to sample the voltage from the radiation of that particular feed. There's going to be a cable, and the cable is all cut to special length. It, it actually goes from this point to this point, and if you look on the top of the uh, sample, you see the error, so it shows you the direction of the feed. And of course the sample cable will connect here and then you will read. Now this meter is set for high and low so you can flip it up and get a reading for high. You can f flip it down and get a reading for low so it can do dual scale. Uh, one thing to remember, have the engineer do this. Don't touch anything in the ATU. Don't open the box. Don't look at it. Yep. Always have the engineer do this. A couple of reasons. One, if something goes wrong, it's his fault, not yours. <laughs> Two, I don't care. These do have a little, this one doesn't, but they usually have little plastic covers on them. These will bite. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not supposed to, but these will bite in high, high RF. So you don't have to worry about burning your fingertips on them. Now, if it's, can we go back one? Yeah. Uh, oh, you got the clicker I got the clicker. Go okay go back one you see these meters sometime and they're plug-in meters as Larry mentioned and the way this works there are dual jacks in those antenna tuning units 
Usually there is a solid jack with just a handle on it, and it's Bakelite material, so it doesn't conduct any kind of power. And there's an empty jack in front. So you plug the meter in in the front or back, whichever way it's set up, and then you pull the other jack out. So you're pushing this one in so both are reading, pull the other one out, and then just this meter readings, and you get your amperage meter reading. Have the engineer do that <laughs> because things do happen and you don't want to be responsible for an issue, especially when you're working in high power like this. And I've seen people who make errors and they'll unplug one before they plug the other one in. And it makes all kind of pretty flames when stuff like that happens. <laughs> and, and then some of these meters, I saw one a, a couple weeks ago at the station I was inspecting. While it looked in good shape, the guy said, oh, go ahead and pull the, no, I'm not touching it. Because it looked just old enough that if something came loose while you were doing it, now you bought it and you're responsible for fixing it. So you don't want to do that. What do you do when the general manager doesn't know how to do it? then he's going to find somebody else to deal with it or an engineer because as an inspector, that is not your responsibility. I might be willing to, where that, uh, to flip that meter switch on and flip it off, but I'm not going to mess with these meters. I mean, I've worked with these. I know Frank has. I know Larry has. And these are things that are solid of a rock, but when they go poof, they go poof big time. So... Uh, I'm not going to plug anything in the ATU, unplug the ATU, open the ATU. That's for the chief, ma uh, chief engineer, the manager, or whoever's there uh, doing it. So the, some, of the, some of the older ones actually had a plunger yeah. where you, you used to be required, uh, I think there was a requirement used to, that it had to be in there all the time, and they made a plunger on the side that you could push it in and it would short the meter out so that the current to the tower would go through a short and not through the meter. Right. Theoretically, that was to keep the lightning from getting it. But if lightning gets in the ATU, all bets are off anyway. So, but the way you would read it was you would just pull that plunger out and it would put the meter in the circuit and you could read it and then close the plunger. But nine times out of 10, the plunger wouldn't move. Or if you pulled it, it, it broke one of the insulators that and was came holding on it. Out. It came out anyway. Or so. then on some of those plungers, they were really nicely made, but then they had a metal knob on the end so you could grab <laughs> onto it. Well, you're in a high RF field. What else is going to happen next? So. But you ha the station has to have a way to show you the antenna current, either by one permanently mounted in there or one that's on a plug-in that will plug into the J-plug. Yeah. That, that's, that's, uh, other than this, th this is the best way, yeah. but other than that is, the plug-in type so you can take it back up to the transmitter shack and hang it on the wall and then when you need to go down to check it you can do that. Uh, I've been to some that didn't have a meter and and, yeah. and uh, yeah. one one guy told me he said well I use the guy across town I go and bar his. I said well you, <laughs> we need to get it because yeah. I, I, I need Well need the to problem is meters technically are calibrated with the equipment that they're in so if you're getting your friends across town, it's yeah. more than likely not calibrated with yours, and there are going to be differences, and you could very easily end up with erroneous readings. So something you have to watch out for. John, in, in, in the old school, we were taught the meter has to read within about two thirds of full scale, but just because you oh. get a that's a meter and it just barely comes right. out. Right. That's with the, the this meter with the delta meter. That's yeah, it's linear, so you don't have to worry about that. That that was n normally because of the resolution. You can yeah. see how close all these uh, right graduations are there. You wouldn't be able to read that very good. Well, in an in in inspection mindset, can you, would you say this meter isn't acceptable, or are we worried about angels on the other end? Just be thankful that there's an AM station. <laughs> I mean, you had a zero to 10 amp meter, and you're looking at like a 500 watt AM daytime, or that... I don't know that that would pass muster. Would well, it? technically, it probably wouldn't pass muster, but if it is, yeah, again, you know, it's a judgment call. If it's reading, and it's reading accurately, mm -hmm. and it has been, I might cut them a little slack and make a recommendation that they need to replace the meter because that's obviously not the original meter. Right. Uh, usually where you run into any meter reading issues are going to be with those stations who operate with, you know, 50 watts at night. And for a while, Delta made a dual scale mm -hmm. meter, but they don't make the, they still make some, but not like they used to. 
and there are certain readings that are so low you just don't read and I really think that if the commission came in, while I can't say that they would do this, if they found everything else in good shape, they'd probably just kind of look the other way as long as they see the transmitter go down to 50 watts or something like that and it's reading reasonably. What about modulation? Modulation. That's, yeah, that's a good question. Well, there's a modulation monitor. Everybody seen one <laughs> oh, of these before? Oh, you mean modulation on the meter? Oh, or on the meter. Oh, oh yeah. Meter. you got to have it turned off, especially on this type meter. Yeah. Yeah. Now the deltas technically, you shouldn't have to, but they still, they still move. The only way to really accurately check your base current reading is with the modulation turned off. And in the old, old arrays, they used to have little buttons yeah. at each site. You'd go out to the ATU, push the button, that'd kill the modulation. And then you could move on to the next tower and do that. Drove the guy on the air crazy when you did that because <laughs> all kinds of things would happen back at the studio but no nah, I know not at all so yeah no modulation for a true accurate reading I was thinking something about with that see that's well that's yeah that's but again if there's no modulation then see the basic thing of course you guys are all in engineering anyway you know that that's the way AM works yeah the more the more modulation the more power you get out which means more current so it's going to fluctuate with the uh, MBCL suppresses the carrier under modulation if you have no modulation you've got full that's correct oh, yeah so yes. all, you, all you do the license is based on an unmodulated carrier but also depends on how that's being done if it's a dynamic carrier control the uh, that's what you're talking about, MCDL. Yeah, yeah, MCDL. There's yeah. two different yeah. ways that's done, and Continental does it one way, and uh, then Nautel does it another. But and, and the difference, Harris. yeah, but the different Harris and Nautel use MCDL, which is the standard that the commission has accepted. Yeah. Anything else other than that is not acceptable. Uh, what Continental was doing, I think, was for shortwave. Yeah. And the shortwave is an entirely different oh, system. Yeah, that's, right. that's exactly yeah. right. Plus so. there's a switch on there that disables it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can, you can do that on your DX50 kits. Yeah. yeah. You can disable that so you can actually read the... Uh, if you're taking field strength readings, you have to disable it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of sure, course. Sure, sure. Yeah. Because you don't want it bouncing around like yeah. that. Let's see what else we got. We've looked at that and... Uh, Here's one that's actually reading. This is this is a meter like this. It's actually reading, and it's uh, it just has an on-off switch. Yeah, it doesn't have a yeah, high. Yeah, it, it, it's not a high-low. This is an older meter, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and it well, actually, it has it off has a plastic right, yeah. cover on the thing, so you don't yeah. get bit either. That's right. <laughs> but trust me, you still can get bit through those. Yeah. Here, here are the J plugs we were talking about that you can you would typically have one of those bait like pieces with a with a regular meter mounted in it and you could pull this out and plug that in. Of course you turn the transmitter off, <laughs> pull that out and plug that in. Now and Larry, then, you didn't clean out your ATU before you took it. I didn't clean out the ATU no the little rodents have been in there. Yeah. <laughs> Look at all the rusty nail the rusty screws in there. Uh, this is the actual formula. Uh, and you and to be an inspector you do have to use a formula. I'm gonna Pass some of these around. Everybody gets one of these. This is an Ohm's Law chart. My wife made those things. She makes coasters. And uh, it's got Ohm's Law. And uh, you, so you have to know a little bit of math uh, to figure out how to do this. So if you go out to the tower to read your, uh, to read the stations and figure out what the power, Ohm's Law power says, uh, uh, Ohm's Law says power is equal to the current squared times the resistance. Now, as he said this morning, you got to look on the license and see what the resistance of the tower is. Now, if it's one like he brought up that doesn't have, you wouldn't have the resistance on there, then what do you do? You don't know what the resistance yeah. is or something, so that, that can get you into trouble. Uh, that's, that's the chart there. This is a neat chart. George Ohm, when he developed this, did, did a really great job, and you can solve for power is I square R, are you, if you knew what the power was and the resistance and you need to know what, how much current you need to run for, we were talking about this at lunch, how much current you need to run for a certain uh, power level, then you could come down here and you divide the resistance, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, resistance divided into power, take the square root of it and it'll tell you what the current is. So that's, 
it just sort of becomes second nature. In our in our classes, we do a, on Monday. We usually do some basic electronics on Mondays, and I said a lot of the formulas you you don't really have to memorize them because they're all over the place. Now you got coasters with them on there, <laughs> but one of the formulas that sort of sticks in your mind is that one, because that one as an inspector you will use uh, quite often. This, this is one that we were, that he was talking about, yeah. that lightning will do weird things. Um, obviously, here's the... Uh, There's your knob. I'm not sure what this was. I think that was the... Uh, was that a grounding? No, that's actually the uh, sample, I think, here, because yeah. switch it in and out and bypass it, and the meter was... Because there's your transformer right there, and then... Is that what that yeah. was? Yeah. Okay. But, but obviously uh, something got it into that work. one, and so there would be not, you, very accurately, that one doesn't read very much. So. It, that, that's out of the scale there, Paul, so you don't, don't have yeah. to worry. Well, actually, that was on MCDL, but it got carried away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you're a directional station, or a non-directional, you go down to the tower, and as, you, as John said, have them open up the box, uh, they used to make them with little windows so you could look through there, but they were always so dirty and crowded yeah. you couldn't see anything in there anyway, so you normally have to take the front off. And some of these boxes haven't been opened, you know, since World War I, yeah. and you, you, can't, you can't get... I'll tell you a story. I went to... Uh, I, I, I get these stories. I, don't, I run into these things. And, and um, I went to a station, and I went out to the tower, and they had a beautiful brand new chain link fence around the AM tower. I said, hey, this is, this, the site was beautiful, clean, it had gravel on the inside and all this kind of stuff. And I looked at the fence and I noticed something weird about the fence. There was no gate. It was just a fence all the way around the tower. And I asked the guy, I said, where's your gate? He said, well, I thought the rule said you had to have a fence around your tower. I said, uh, yeah, but you you go have to get. Why would you need to get in there? I said, well, for maintenance, working on the tower and all. And I said, I also need to get in there, so I can read the antenna current. How do you do that? I said, there's an antenna current meter, or there should be one, in the tuning unit. Where's the tuning unit? I said, that white box sitting in there. Oh, you need to get into that white box. So I got a ladder. You can step ladder and climb over the fence. <laughs> but he said it's not going to do you any good because we lost the key to that little box and you can't get in there anyway. <laughs> Obviously he didn't pass. I, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but on, on a special like a 50 like uh, Frank's got, uh, there's a lot of RF out there. And if you, you go and you start switching switches, I know even up at um, Nashville at WSB, I, was, I mean at WSM, I was out there with, with Watt one time and he, before he would flip the switch on his meter like that, he did it with his pen. He, he wasn't going to yeah, touch yeah. it, you know, because there's a lot of RF uh, floating around. But in a directional system, you don't typically read the antenna current. You read it at the common point where, where this transmitter comes out and goes through a phaser that splits and feeds to each individual tower, and that's where you actually read uh, the current. This is the common point meter here. And the, typically, the resistance will be 50 ohms. That's the way it's set up, that it's always 50 ohms. So you can calculate what you're supposed to read. Now, I do understand that it is legal to actually use that common point meter if, if you're like you are, where you're 50 kilowatts day, uh, non-directional, <coughs> and another power at night, non-directional, but it still flows through this circuitry here that you can actually read the uh, the direct the non-directional current through that meter as long as everything is set up and calibrated correctly. Is that you, have that you is that is correct? Yeah. We had a similar situation. The common point meter, of course, was in the phaser just inside the building. Then you had a base current meter, and you did have to calibrate between right, the two right. to be sure that everything was reading appropriately. If, if he has documented that that he has calibrated that those two meters together, the one down at the tower and the one up in the in the phaser cabinet with a common point meter, then that as long as nothing changed out in the field, 
Of course, it would yeah. throw that off too. Yeah, if it, it would. did, it would, that would be off too. So that's something you need. And to actually, that could uh, you could also utilize the uh, Potomac Instruments uh, phase monitor to do the reading, and that you would calibrate to this meter here. Right. So that would be only in a daytime non-directional mode for that one tower. Here's a typical uh, two tower phase monitor. The way, those of you, how many have directional rays or have worked around directional rays? <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, it's, it's a pretty, it takes a lot of math uh, to, when they design these things. I don't know, in years ago when they used to do it by hand and a slide rule, they probably went through a pack of paper and who knows how many pencils because you got to use rectangular to polar formulas and all that kind of stuff. Now you do it on a computer, which is a piece of cake. But depending on what the consultant says the pattern's supposed to be, you typically have to null out your signal to protect somebody else. That's why you go directional. You may have another. Our station in Montgomery was on 740. We had to protect WSB in Atlanta on 750. So we had to suck the signal in going towards Atlanta. And there's also a 740 in Tullahoma, Tennessee. Right. And so we had two nulls, one going towards Atlanta and one going towards Tullahoma, Tennessee. And you do that by multiple towers, by the amount of power that you feed to each tower and the phase relationship between the towers. So this antenna monitor allows you to look at and verify that the amount of power that goes to each tower and the relative phase between the different towers stays within a, uh, a specified amount. And this is something you want to look at. If, if they're like, like uh, jocks here, Frank Station, they're non-directional during the day, they're directional at night, we'll always ask a station if that's the case for them to switch to nighttime just long enough for me to look at the phase monitor, uh, antenna monitor to make sure that it's correct. Here's one that has 12 towers. I don't know where that is. Somebody was an idiot and had more money than they knew what to do with because that's just the real estate for 12 towers would be expensive. I don't there. I think there's is there one in New Orleans. Cliff. Cliff. There's Cliff in Dallas. Cliff. Yeah, I guess they it. that's what I said. Yeah, it's six uh, eleven ninety. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah. then there's another one across the river. Well, there's one in Detroit. And then there's one in St. Catherine, uh, Ontario, right across the river from um, Buffalo. And I think the, there may be one other one, but uh, Cliff is the most famous. Mm -hmm. the, the, I've heard horror stories from engineers that had multiple towers like this because in the old days, you did have to go down and read the antenna current. And when you changed pattern, you had to do that. So it would take them hours <laughs> driving around on, or walking or whatever to all these towers. And if it was very, depending on how the ground was, it was sort of difficult yeah. to get out there. And especially in a swampy area, you had to dodge the alligators. And, but you have to go out to each one of the towers at pattern change and read those antenna currents. Yeah. Yep, you had to do it seven out of ten days, I think was the way it was. It was, yeah, seven out of ten days. So you got, you know, it's like you could take a break over the weekend or something, you know, and <laughs> start over again. Yeah, to, to, to get over all the tick bites and everything. So. But that's that's where that is. That was a critical array, isn't it? N not, uh, well, that may be for critical arrays now, but in the old days, no, that training. was a standard array. I just think I want to know with that phase oh, monitor. Oh, 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 yeah. Display, I'm thinking that means that that's a critical array that it's monitoring there because the tolerances were a lot tighter in your phase and loop curve. Yeah, yeah, that may be so, yeah. But simply what you do is you you always have a, a reference tower and you, you go to what, it, especially on this one here, it's easier to do. You go to whatever the reference tower is, um, it must be tower one on this one. You go to tower one and the phase should read zero, or you calibrate it, the phase should read zero, and the current should read one, which would just be a reference. Mm -hmm. And then you would punch tower number two, and it would tell you how much power you were feeding to the second tower, the ratio. So if you were feeding one watt to this tower, you may be feeding 0.7 watts to the other tower. And it would read out on here. And then the phase difference. And you'll see here, here are the limits, and this is what you're looking for as an inspector. The current limits 
when you read the current limits on the towers, has to stay within plus or minus 5% from the re reference tower. The phase ratio, the amount that the signal is either delayed uh, between the signals of the power going to the towers, has to stay within plus or minus 3 degrees. There are some sites, I have never run into one with a critical array. If you run into one with a I critical array, either. the tolerance is a little bit tighter. And I'm not, to be honest with you, I'll have to admit, I don't, under, I don't really know what a critical array is unless it's really tight nulls. Is that what a critical array is? Oh, is we used to have thing. one in Jackson, the old WOKJ 1550. Yeah, yeah the one out on the interstate. Yeah, that yeah. was a five or six tower critical array. And yeah, it had to be maintained even tighter than that. Yeah. I'm thinking the current ratio was, it was yeah, it, it's much lower. The phase ratio was like one degree. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's ratio. done because of the nulls that you created are really yeah. critical. Right. You may be really close to somebody. Yeah, I don't else. think they uh, there are any critical array. I don't think anything as far as a critical array has been licensed in years. It's just what's left over. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've never seen one. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't know. You know. One of the things you'll run into, and of course, when you start looking at this, you may find a site. We actually had one in Macon. It was five tower inline that one of the towers was was floating, but it was a, uh, a negative tower. Right. It would actually supply power back to the system. Yeah. And, and if you looked at that on the monitor, one day you go out there and it's drawing power from the system, in other days, depending on the atmosphere, it'd be supply power back. So it would go from positive to negative on the thing. It's sort of, sort of weird. You don't see many of those either, but. Uh, you don't want to see those. No, and you, you don't want to try to work on one. Uh -uh. I asked one day, I said, why don't we just take it down? Why is it here, you know? But uh, uh, this is a field strength meter. Did you bring yours? Uh, oh, you I got a oh, you got it? Okay. Did it get hit by lightning too? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, this is not a very good picture it's out of focus. We'll see one tomorrow when we go out there. Uh, uh, hi. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. You want to bring it in? We'll show people. You got it with you now? Yeah, okay. Uh, this is actually used when you go out in the field to make measurements to make sure that your to make sure that your your pattern is correct. Now, the monitor that you're reading, uh, we were looking at a while ago, the AM19 monitor tells you what's happening right there at the base of the tower. It doesn't tell you what's happening out in the field, away away from the tower. And you may have a situation where uh, somebody put up a cell tower or somebody built a big metal building, as in the case in, at Mobile, they built some big shipyard right next to a two tower array. And it just really messed up the pattern, <laughs> something terrible, you know. And How about a wheel or a big? Uh, oh, Ferris wheel? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Well, I bet that would cause that. Yeah. It, it, it constantly changing. one. <laughs> had one of those in Madison, Tennessee, back several years ago. Mm. It was split right in the middle of a four-tower array. Really? <laughs> yeah. How did they get that through? How do you do T in a Ferris wheel? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> the, uh, if, if the cell company builds a tower in so many, what is it, three kilometers or something? Or is it? Is it, is it? Yeah, I, I, I forget I'm three or one or whatever it is. In between uh, of a directional it a array, years back, but it I don't will remember. Between non-directional and directional, uh, I think the differences are di different. But, yeah, and if they build it, then they supposedly they're supposed to come in and do a before measurement and then an after measurement, and if it affected your pattern then they are required to detune that tower so that it didn't show up. This is actually a, um, a meter here. Oh, it's got batteries in it too. <laughs> Where you can actually go out and you can actually tune it in and, um, and see the signal. Which, the way that it actually works is, and, and if you inspect a station, I don't know how John does it, but some engineers, some inspectors tell me that they take their own. Some others say they use the stations. Mm -hmm. I take my own because I have one, but I expect the station to be using their own. You yeah. can use it as a comparison, but uh, again, the station is responsible for providing the field intensity 
meter and having, and having access. So if you're going to be doing the test and checking it, then you should be able to utilize the station's meter. 850. 850. 850. Yeah. Here. Oh. And, uh, okay. Go to 850. What, what you would do, you will actually go out with this meter to a particular point that the commission has assigned for you, and you can actually measure the signal. Now, in, in the olden days, you were required to actually go out once a month and measure this to make sure you didn't exceed what they told you you could, you could uh, actually transmit. Now, I'm not calibrating on purpose, but... Yeah. And somebody's taking very good care of their meter. ...to push this conversation, the culture, to push it in the political realm. And we're also seeing them engage a lot of their focus on the political is most oriented. Now, you ha the antenna is actually up in the lid, and you orientate okay, you it. you see the meter right here. And just by moving it, that's pointing towards the antenna. You see how the signal cleared? So now we know where the station's located. <laughs> unless, it's re yeah, unless it's reflecting off of something. Yeah. Yes. So. And then the, the, in the license, and we'll look at an AM, uh, John can bring up on the, uh, bring up an AM license in a minute, and we can actually see, it will actually tell you at this monitor point, which on a certain radio, so many kilometers away from the tower, the maximum signal that you can radiate in that direction is. Who is that? Yeah. See if you can bring on the, on your computer, bring up uh, an AM station. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. L look at uh, WMSP, I know. Well, you got your monitor points too, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Does it give directions? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And they've got colored pictures too. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. It's on the website. It may not be on the website, though. But you, you have, as an inspector, when you go to make sure you look at the AM monitor first and make sure the parameters are right. And then okay, typically we, you will, uh, oh, wait a minute. You'll, uh, there we you, go. You'll actually go out in the, uh, you'll actually go out in the field with the meter and make sure that you're not radiating any further than the commission says you're supposed to. Now, do, do the night. I'm going yeah. to show a couple things. This is what it looks like when you bring up a FCC station. info. Yeah. So you see this listed twice. There's a license for day and a license for night. Now we're going to look at nighttime. We don't drop power much. Yeah. <laughs> now you notice there's your information on your nighttime array. It's two towers. One tower is 136 degrees, which would be the daytime tower, and the other is 68 degrees, which would be the nighttime tower. And there's all the pertinent information. Oh, your tower's a different length, height, so. Yeah. Yeah. And then let's look at the applications. You can go to other applications. And, nope. That's the bad thing about these. Yep. Mm -hmm. We'd have to look at the file. But if you see here, you see where it's showing there's a 301 and a 302. Now, you could pull, technically, you should be able to pull up the license there maybe nope you nope. get the license see this is some of the problems you run into with the FCC and uh, no it's it it's grayed out FCC. Oh, really? yeah. yeah go to fccdata.org okay it's very similar to this but it's got a lot more information I found FCC data all together Oh, that's part of REC, yeah. Yeah, REC, Thank you. 
This same stuff. Uh, yeah. I think both of those refer back to the CDBS. Yep, so. they do. That's pretty much normal. Every once in a while you'll find some differences, but very few. But we'll get to see. Oh, you're looking at the... Uh, there where his towers are located. Okay. You may have to go back over to public files then, uh, to see it. Yeah. But anyway, that gives you the... Uh, we took a shot at it. Yeah, go, go, uh, go to public files and uh, do MSP. I know there's this app. Okay. Go to public file? Yeah, the public okay. files out. Okay. Hang on one second. WMSP. Whoa, what happened there? Must have hit the wrong button. Sorry. This, when you actually look at the license, it will show you the monitor, depending on how many monitor points you have, it'll tell you how far it is from the tower, so many kilometers, and what degree the null is, and then it will give you a figure which says the signal that you're reading on the FIM cannot exceed so many millivolts per meter. And if, if you read that and you're below that, then you're legal. Your pattern is okay. If you're out, then you have to reduce power. It says license was canceled. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's cumulus. <laughs> no, her call her. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go on down and we'll see. Uh, I got a real one. Yeah. Okay. Not me. I don't work there anymore. There you go. Yeah, you can see all the uh, here's the right here's the readings on the meter, uh, the reference tower. Uh, oh, scroll down a little further. That's the theoretical. Um, there you go, right here. The um, it's um, the reference tower phase is zero and the current is one. But then when you flip over to the next tower you'll see the current is like 0.869. So if you were feeding one watt into that tower, the reference tower, this one's only getting eight-tenths of a watt. And the, and the uh, phase of the signal is 99 degrees uh, behind what's going to this one. And that's what gives you your, your, uh, your null. So if you scroll on down, then you'll see the information about the monitor points right here. The radials... There you go. There's a location. Yeah, uh, go up to where it shows actually the uh, the point right here. Uh, 74 and a half degree radial at 5.9 uh, kilometers away from the tower, uh, daytime here, it would be, uh, we could read only at that particular point, that monitor point should not be any more than seven millivolts per meter, 7.68, which is what you're reading on here. The 355 degree radial. The 74 and a half on this one was the one that was going to Atlanta to protect WSB. The 355 degree radial was the one that was going to Tullahoma, Tennessee. At that one, if we went out 6.28 kilometers, our maximum signal can only be 8.36. So we had two monitor points. Now, if you scroll down to the directions, and this is uh, what Frank was talking about, it'll actually give you the directions to the points. And this is old, so obviously when you get out there, none of this is going to be there anymore. It says here, point two on the 74 and a half degree radial is 500 feet from the road by a fence corner in a pecan orchard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this one says um, point three on 355 degree radial, 300 feet from the road through a field gate. I, have, uh, I happen to know this is the medium on I-85. So that's not a field gate anymore. Uh, we, we've seen and heard stories of them that you would see. You go and you go uh, um, 10 yards from the three pine trees with the red tape on it or red paint on it or yeah. go down to where the four cows are in the field and go 100 feet from where the four cows are. So 
<laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you one. And this is no joke. This all happened within the past few months. A consultant was at an AM site, and they were running. They were having all kind of problems with their pattern, and they were running the radials. And uh, they're going down this dirt road to one of the points, and the engineer. They come to a gate, and they pass through the gate, and there's this big sand pit there. And it's full of water. And he says, well, I'm lost. I, we must have taken a wrong turn. This is where one of my monitor points are. This hadn't been here long. And so they drive around the sand pit. They're able to drive around. They get to the other side. And there's a, a guy from the company there that obviously manages this thing. And the engineer hops out and says, how long has this pit been here? And, of course, the consultant's there. He says, 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> so it's obviously been a while since they had been there. There's one very unusual thing about this license and those monitor points. Can anybody tell me what it is? There's only two. That's exactly right. Yep. That is an extreme rarity that you only find two. Two towers? That's a two tower. Yeah, two tower, yeah. but I mean... That's a very uh, simple pass. Yes. It is. I, I just had two nulls is all yeah. I had, so... And, and, but I mean, you may have, I've seen some, I think the most I've had to do was 10. <laughs> but I mean, that's very unusual and Larry Those two was... Towers have three. Yeah, exactly. The, the, and the yeah. major lobe, too. Yeah. He was just living right, I guess. I was. Yeah. So? yeah. <laughs> that's ten, 10 at night, 2 in the day. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Different sites, too. Oh, that makes it even worse. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you'd, and there are still a lot of those around. I don't think there's any in Alabama or what Georgia or sites? South Carolina that are dual sites. There's one in Huntsville. Uh, the one you went up yeah, there, they, no, they, I think they changed. They changed that. UMP. I think. That was uh, no UMP's. Uh, they're two top. They're two sites. A daytime site and a uh, nighttime site. Oh, is it? Maybe they are. I don't Wait know. a minute. Now Did, you didn't you go up there and work on well, that? Not uh, a UMP. I worked on. Yeah, UMP. No, it's a, just a, uh, a thousand watt daytime or a thousand watt radio station. <coughs> okay, he I, I, he's got one that the direction was out on the uh, out on sixty five. That may be right. I thought that was. I, it used to be the old. They used to have two sites. That's the one on seven seventy. Yeah, seven seventy is two sites. Is okay, it two sites? is it, it still is two, two sites? Site? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I think well, it, it got one site for daytime and one site. Yeah. Yeah. Nine fifty in Montgomery used to have two sites because the nighttime site or, or the daytime site wouldn't work as a nighttime to cover the city of license, so they had to build another site in closer to the city for the nighttime to cover. So it had two, two separate sites. But, uh, but that's what that meter is for. And you either have to have one yourself or rely on the, the stations. The problem in relying on the stations meter is, if you notice, there's a calibration on this. This one was calibrated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, even calibrate them they won't calibrate it. What they'll do, what I've heard from other people, they will call you and say they can't calibrate it, and they'll give you three thousand dollars towards the new one. Oh, really? Fourteen yeah. thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, what a deal! <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, I have one that's only about two or three years old on calibration. So they were still doing it a few years ago. Yeah. It depends on what's wrong with it. That's the key to it. So what I've done is I've gone out and compared it to five or six different stations. Yeah, that, that's perfectly all right. Uh, as long as it was within range, yeah. I figured theirs are, and so is mine. Yeah, trust me, a lot of guys would get together and compare their meters and see if they're still accurate because there are thousands of those things around. Yeah, yeah. we actually did that when we put this site in and, and did the initial proof. We had like... Um, we had five meters because we put people out in different directions. We all met at the same location and set them up side by side and made sure they all agreed uh, So w before you go out. Because when you build one of these sites, uh, or you used to, they now have a, a new system, MOM system out, computerized system, but you used to have to go out in uh, eight different directions, out 20 miles, I think it was, and make measurements. The first couple of miles had to be walked they were close in measurements and then you'd go out and find roads. And uh, I remember we were doing one and one of my monitor readings was right outside the gate of the prison. And I, uh, I was sort of afraid to set up out there, you know, because I was afraid I'd be the next uh, contestant for that jail cell. But, yeah. 
I did go and tell the guard what I was doing. It, what, I, what I did, and this is just a hint if you ever get into this, I always carried a box of radio station coffee mugs. That way, if you go out somewhere to a farmer and need to get out in his cornfield, you say, yeah, let me give you one of our coffee mugs. Uh, if it's okay if I go out here on the edge of your field and make a reading. So I did give the, the guard. I, I was afraid to give him one because all the other guards didn't want one. He was the only one with a gun, so. <laughs> Sounds like today's prison. <laughs> That's right. We had one in Columbia where the main radio ran through Fort Jackson. <laughs> And the only time that they would let us run the radio would be on Sunday. And because it went through the bombing range, they gave us radios and had an escort. Really? Yes. <laughs> so they let us. I said, you sure you don't want to just drive me out there? Well, no, you can't get in one of the military vehicles. You have to go in your own car. I said, what if I hit something? He said, you'll know it. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a monitor. It was when we were running the whole radio. The monitors are close into the station. Yeah. Well, I didn't have any mics with me at the time. So. Well, I had a radio, their radio. Yeah, but that was all right. Yeah. Don't ask me why, but oh, <laughs> yeah. Running the radio is now with the method of moment proof. That's pretty much. A, oh, uh, Ben anymore. Ben Dawson and Ron Rackley, probably the two AM gurus of all times. Uh, they have done more for AM and improving the ease of bringing in an AM directional system than anybody else. And uh, uh, not that there's a lot of AM directionals going in anymore, no. but but they're still amazingly doing a lot of work. Um, they just finished up a bunch of work out on Vashon Island. I had the pleasure of going out there about a month ago, which I think there are seven or nine AM stations on this island. Three, I think, are standalone sites, and the other two sites each have two stations in them, or three sites with two stations each in them. It's Vashon Island. It's across uh, the bay from Seattle. Only way to get there is by ferry boat. Great ground conductor. Oh, it's oh, phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to have somebody there all the time because you can't get there in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. They just live on the island. Yeah, they do live on the island. There's a couple of contractors that live out there full time and do all the stations. But that's part of the inspection. You do have to check those, uh, those monitor points. We talked about the fencing around the tower. This is what John was talking about. It actually varies with the power whether you're 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 50, and actually the band, uh, which I've never, of course it doesn't really vary very much except up at the high end, but this is how many meters that the fence should be away from the tower. Now most people, I know uh, Frank out there has got his about the size of a football field yeah. away from his, you know, his, his is huge, but that is the minimum recommended because of of RF. Those towers are hot, as you know, and you got to fence them in to keep people and uh, animals and stuff from getting in there. And there will still be people who break in and steal because one of the stations I work with just had some of their copper strap stolen and they left after getting one strap for some unknown reason. <laughs> they got inside the fence and cut a lot of stuff, but they only took one thing, one strap. So I, I saw a picture where somebody had broke in and was going to steal the coax, and they had a hacksaw was cutting through it. The only thing that was there was half of the hacksaw still stuck in the <laughs> yeah. As soon as they hit the interconductor, you know, <laughs> they were gone. So, uh, uh, this is something you need to look at. Make sure the fence is, is good and not falling down. Obviously, this is not very good. It's one side of it is falling down. Uh, one inspector told me one time that they went to a site, and one site, it was a wooden fence, and one side had fell down. And so he brought that to the attention of the manager and all, and he said, man, that must just have happened. Because we were out there a couple of days ago and everything was fine, and the inspector told him, said, man, y'all must have really good soil out here because that oak tree is like four foot tall now <laughs> that was going up through the fence. So it didn't just happen the day before. So make sure, you, you can either use wooden fence or you can use um, well, you've got chain link fence around yours. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you if, have any? Yeah, if, yeah, if, if yeah. you do have chain link fence, be sure it's properly grounded to the yes. ground system because it will talk to you if it doesn't. And that's it not, will bite you yes, it's yeah. not a good yeah. feeling. By the way, notice his, ground, his strapping. 
Now that 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 does look good. He did that right. Just didn't have a good fence there. Yeah, it had a good, yeah. good ground system and all. And the idea. Oh, this one. <laughs> Yeah. The, oh, yeah. The idea, like this fence, wouldn't be acceptable under any circumstances, even because it's too short. You want to be sure that nobody can climb over it, or kids can get under it or through it. So that you could probably, depending on the person, maybe get over it pretty easily without a ladder. <laughs> yeah. I've heard these discussions about if you've got multiple towers on a property and they've got like barbed wire fence all the way around it. I've had owners try to argue with me. Well, I've got a fence all the way around now, it. Well, I now, that, that is in the that rules. Is, if, you, if you have a it tower site, you either have to fence the individual tower or have the property fenced in. Uh, but that's really hard to maintain because if it's out in the field and cows and all, who knows what condition it's in. Yeah. So, but again, it has to be fencing that somebody can't easily get over, right. under, or go through. So. Not just Barbed a wire fence. wouldn't be acceptable uh, unless it was maybe chicken fence or, or something like that. But again, it's got to be enough to... Do. And be very careful of razor wire. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, there's a site that they have razor wire, and I don't know how to get rid of it because it is... It's a hazard. It's a and, lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. No property is worth a human life. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree, and it's lawsuit. And yet I had, I had a police officer tell me on a site where AEM copper got stolen recently. He said, why don't you just energize the fence? I said, because then I'd be liable if somebody got electrocuted. He said, we wouldn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, I guess if they do, you better be sure they're dead. So. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's got to be locked, too. This guy told me it was locked. <laughs> And, and it was. It, it was locked. The, uh, but only half, half of the hasp was there. So uh, the things, that's things you need to look at. Uh, be careful about people. The, these type things here, these hasps, are not very good. I was at a station recently one time. We went out there, and they said they had lost the key to the, to the lock. And he said, that's, that's no problem. He just sort of bent the post over and slid the door open. So uh, in my report, I said, you need to replace that. Uh, chain is much better some, uh, through there because those don't hold very well. You can prize those and get, uh, get around them. Uh, FM power measurements. And any other questions about AM? And we'll move on to FM right quick like. Uh, this is a power meter that, that we talked about earlier. If it's calibrated and it's calibrated in the correct dummy load, although even at that, it may not be reading exactly like uh, what it should. And typically, we go back to Ohm's Law again, and we come up with this calculation, the plate voltage times the plate current times whatever the efficiency of the transmitter has to be. The first thing I do when I walk in an AM, an FM site, is I bring out my, my iPhone, the calculator, and I'll read his plate current, and I'll read his plate current, and then spend the next hour trying to figure out what his efficiency is because he's forgot what it is, yeah. but he can't find it. So, uh, again, always recommend that they get a, a label maker and post it on the transmitter. Yeah. And every and, once in a while, I run into an engineer, and I hope none of y'all are ever guilty. They'll whip out a marker and write it on the transmitter. Oh and no, I'll no. Want to cringe? Yeah. But uh, don't uh, write on transmitters. No, that's, that's again. That there's a place in hell for people who do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, do post that or as uh, earlier on my maintenance log, yeah. if you have that printed on your maintenance log somewhere where it's easily found. Uh, but if it's on the transmitter, you won't get in trouble that way. And that way you can calculate it right out and then you can compare that with what's on the license. Hopefully it's on the license. Yeah. And then uh, I know Angelo used to do this. He would do it on his calculator. He never would say anything. He'd just turn around and show it to you. Yeah. Does, does, does that match your license? <laughs> but that's what you have to do uh, on the FM. The, the meter, the power meter, um, is good just for general uh, assurance that you're running pretty much. Uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to them like we were talking about there. They can be very inaccurate unless you have calibrated it into a calibrated dummy load and you know that it's correct. But as you mentioned earlier, 
where your pickup is in the line will actually affect it uh, as well. Um, plate voltage meter, um, read that, and then read the uh, plate current, and then multiply it times, uh, times the efficiency. Uh, this is not actually part of your inspection, but uh, I always, if they're running HD and they have the capability to look at the, look at the uh, band pass, I always, if, if they have it, I always look at it to make sure they look similar that they are somewhere in the mass where they're supposed to be. It's not, it may be later on because the commission's rules are continuously being updated, but it, it's very hard to read uh, digital carriers, unless you've got a spectrum analyzer that can go in and read it. So you just, uh, when I first, when HD first came out, I was a little worried about that because your signal is actually a combination of the analog and, and the HD signal. It was, when HD first came out, the digital signal was supposed to be minus 20 dB below the carrier, analog carrier. And now they allow you to go up to most people went up to 14, and some you can actually go up to 10 uh, with, with, with permission from, from the commission. And my, I questioned several people. I said, how do you, when you, your license, the power, the TPO that's on the license is the analog. There is no indication of what the, how many watts are you putting out digital? And I was told, well, the only way you can do that effectively was with the spectrum analyzer and calculate it out. But apparently the commission is not, as far as I know, not pushing that to make sure that your digital power is correct. Well, Have you heard them? Uh, they really haven't said a lot, but uh, you are required to check it. And that information should be just like your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, proof equipment proof, you should check it for spurious. The biggest problem, a lot of the uh, spectrum analyzers, I say a lot, there are a number of them that actually have the mast already built in, mm -hmm. so it's easy to see. Usually the problem you run into is right here on either side, or actually right in this area here. So uh, that's just something you have to be aware of. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't caught up with all that yet. So. Yeah, I, I, I see a time when they're going to come up with some way for the inspector to actually make sure that you're running the correct injection yeah. uh, of, of the digital because that is a, that's a standard yeah. and somehow or another you got to come up with a way to do Maybe somebody will come up with a meter to do that. I, yeah, and, uh, and we're, not, we're not recommending under any circumstances you go out and start toting a spectrum analyzer or anything like that around. No. This is all stuff that the station should have available, not necessarily a spectrum analyzer because they are expensive, but the documentation to show that they've been operating properly. Also, um, something that kind of throws a monkey wrench in the works in a lot of the HD installations is a lot of them will have separate antennas for the analog and right. mm -hmm. HD. Yep. And there'll be several hundred feet difference spacing, plus they'll have a different number of bays. Uh, you're not going to be able to get anything accurate anywhere inside the building at all. No. The only way you can even get close is several miles away. Mm -hmm. And then just look at the ratios. Well, the commission, let's see, is the 75% rule that the HD has to be within 75%? I mean, it has to be 75% of the... The, the injection level? Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, and then the biggest problem you run into when you're doing multiple antennas like that is the, uh, the mixing or not mixing of the, of the nulls because you will get, and that's something in this room we won't be concerned with, but it's nice to know that if it's not the same antenna, it's separate antennas, you're gonna have different nulls are gonna hit at different locations right. and you very easily could have the digital signal close in overpower the analog signal and the listener would only receive that or perceive it as some type of noise or static on top of their analog station. And I've seen that happen in a couple of instances and what the station did was actually go in and give everybody HD radios and, and solve that issue until they moved to a different site, which they had in <laughs> plans. But, but uh, that can be a problem, and usually it's a problem more in a uh, 
populated area near downtowns and highly residential areas and that kind of thing around tower sites as opposed to rural areas. I ran into the exact opposite of that. I had where the analog was over nulling the digital out within a certain area. Mm -hmm. They had analog on one tower, HD was on another tower just on the other side of the building. This was a non-com right. college. You would hit like about a seven or eight mile gap where my radio would blend to HD and it would just go silent. Mm -hmm. Wow. You get back <laughs> close enough into the station, you start picking up the HD. If you disable the HD, you can carry the analog. Interesting. The I hadn't I hadn't seen that one yet. So, but That's the only one I've ever that, seen. There's some system. oddities out there with HD and analog when you're doing separate antennas that you run into like that. So. Mm -hmm. All right, TV, let's move to TV. TV is really easy, as you guys know, <laughs> they work in TV. Uh, they have a, a, an Agilent power meter that uh, has to be calibrated. Uh, uh, how, how often those have to be calibrated, uh, Wendell? Is it yearly or, or every two years, or do you know? Yes, they should be annually. They should be sent back for recalibration to the factory. Uh, annually? Uh, yeah. They, they actually read out in, in uh, DBK or D, uh, DB or DBK, and that just plugs into a port uh, at the output of the mass filter so you can get uh, a true reading. So it's very, very easy for a TV station. That's how you read, read it. Uh, these are type units that sometimes you will see one that they can bicycle around to other stations because they, they do work quite well over. Uh, I don't think they're frequency dependent, are they? You can use them no. in multiple stations. Huh? What's the part number on that thing? The what, number? What's the model number on that? Do you know, Brian? Motor RPM. Motor RPM. We just started buying stuff. Brian bought one. I'm going to buy about four or five next year. But in the basement of your computer, software. And, you know, oh, okay. I don't know. Uh, can you see the model number? It's. I think they only make one. <laughs> yeah. Is this an Agilent power I can't, I can't read it, but I think yeah. that's the only one I've ever seen, so. This, the one we're buying is uh, in many circuits, and uh, it works great. Brian's used it. We compared it to one of those. Uh, they're the software, ver software version? Mm -hmm. They're many, many circuits. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, uh, pretty good. Uh, thanks. I got it in the truck. Uh, we'll run through a couple of other things here. We're getting about to the end here. Um, maintenance of the trans maintenance log of the transmitter. We've talked about that. Make sure you keep a maintenance log. The um, in means and procedure to maintain the correct modulation level. Um, here's a modulation monitor over here. And um, although the commission doesn't specifically say that you have to have a modulation monitor mounted in the in the rack, you still have to have some way. To determine that you're modulating correctly. Now, how you go about do that, doing that, the commission I don't think specifies. They do that. not specify on AM. There are two ways to do it: with a scope, mm -hmm. or with a modulation monitor, a calibrated, recent calibrated mod modulation monitor. Because the caps do dry out in those, and funky things happen, and they get hit by lightning and everything else. Bell R, I think that one was about five or six hundred dollars to. To service and go through. On FM it's a lot easier because most of the newer transmitters have very accurate modulation monitors built into the exciters or the transmitter. So that's a lot easier. And then there are a number of small portable devices. Uh, uh, Diva makes some portable units that you can use in conjunction with your laptop and you look at RBDS mm -hmm. and, and all variety of uh, uh, FM uh, uh, items, including your modulation, so it's a lot easier than the AM to deal with. A lot of this stuff, the commission says, that you just have to make sure that your station is operating in accordance with your license. And how you go about determining that is really left up to the station, but you got to do it, because if they come in and you're, then you're not uh, legal. Uh, the same thing occurs now. This is not a big problem anymore much anymore because all the phase lock loop stuff you know pretty much stays on frequency somebody mentioned about getting an outside service to check in your frequency I, I know years ago when i was working at a little am station down in south alabama there was a guy in birmingham 
Claude Gray, Claude Gray mm -hmm. that had, we lived up on the mountain, I think, with a whole bunch of antennas and stuff. And we were a daytime AM station. And the first Thursday or second Thursday of each month, I think, I had to go out, turn the transmitter on at 2 a.m. and play Hawaiian music for 15 minutes. So he knew that was me, <laughs> and he would measure the frequency because I was probably the only station playing Hawaiian music at 2 a.m., you know. And then we would get a little postcard saying, we measured you, you're one cycle higher or two cycles lower or whatever. Claude probably had a whole library that he sold on a regular basis to stations so they could play Hawaiian music That's in the right. middle of the night. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, I, I want to run through this real quick uh, j just so that you know there are certain things that you as, a, as an inspector uh, need to be aware of and to make you a successful uh, inspector. One is have excellent organization. This is sort of a psychological, uh, philosophical kind of thing here. But have excellent organization. Make sure you keep all your, your paperwork and uh, all your reports and your notes. I know John, like I, I keep all the reports of the stations that I do in a file so I can go back. and Because I did have the commission call me one day and ask me about a certain station and a certain problem they had. And I said, yeah, I got the report right here. And they said, well, send me a copy of it. And I did, so I don't know what they ever yeah. did. They, the they will do that. And, and you can also have things uh, happen to you, like suddenly you get uh, listed in a notice of violation. Oh, I've had that happen before. And, and while it wasn't anything negative on my side, it was the owner of the station showing the new owner that he cared about the station and he had brought us in to do those inspections. But you don't like to see your name in an NOV. So just keep that, keep that in mind. They well, do check. One of the problems with being an inspector and going to inspect in a station, you're in, you are inspecting that station at a point in time. The day that you're in there, the stuff that you observe is at that point in time. Now what happens tomorrow, who knows? I mean, you can go in and check the power and it's right. The next day they go and turn it up. I mean, what are you going to do about that? So you can't. So that's why the, we keep our report because yeah. we tell them on this date and this time, this is what I observed as an inspector. What happened two weeks?